release your breath. Release your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. you this morning, not proud in the gift that we bring, not taking any kind of pride in it at all, because God, it came from you. Just as we sing, Father, it's your breath in our lungs that comes out as we worship you. And just as a young child going and asking for money from their parents to turn around and buy a gift for their parents because they have nothing to buy it with to begin with, we come and offer our worship to you this morning. We didn't come up with it. We didn't gift ourselves the ability to do it. Everything we bring this morning, our time, our money, our service, it's all from you first. Even the attention that we pay when we sing or when we listen to your word, Father, the intellect that is in us that understands what's being said, Father, it all comes from you. Nothing that, that we bring can have any pride taken at this point. So we bow as humbly as we know how, Father, and we thank you for every gift that you've given, and we turn it back to you in praise. Just with your heads bowed, eyes closed, let's pray this this morning. If you don't sing well, that doesn't matter. I don't sing well half the time. <laughs> And this is really not about anybody else hearing you or seeing you. It's about your acknowledgement to the Lord that everything you give to him was first from him. That before you ever thought about salvation, he loved you first while you were yet a sinner. God, we pray that you would just open your word to us through Adam this morning. God, that when we read it, it would change us. Pray this with me this morning. It's your breath in our lungs. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you. Appreciate y'all. Uh, the band is awesome. I love it always. The acoustic or louder or whatever it is, the lyrics uh, that get selected here for church. Uh, Paul does a great job with that. I appreciate y'all this morning singing so beautifully and leading us. Um, listen, I am not that great of a gift giver. Crystal's here; she can tell you. But I've nailed it <laughs> this year. <laughs> 
I'm like redeeming myself. I'm so pumped. We all need a redeemer, right? You know I was a preacher, so I was going to tie it in. But man, I am telling you, I have nailed it. So I'm pumped about that. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about what happened to me yesterday um, with my um, cr crazy wife. We'll tell you that in a little bit. But another thing that happened yesterday was two guys in this room, Eric Ballou and Rusty Bishop, came and helped put basketball goals together for the Boys and Girls Club. We had three other men from different churches, which is one thing that I was pumped about and I wanted to see. And we had a pretty good time. Um, it was, uh, it was uh, a little bit of a workout with the, with the hacksaw. Uh, got a little workout in. I felt pretty good about it. And then um, later on that afternoon, I spent about 20 minutes wrapping one present. But I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But shout out to these two men. Appreciate y'all. They didn't know I was going to call them out. But I called them out. Nobody volunteered so that I would call them out. But that's exactly what I did. And I appreciate them. Welcome to week number 125 of the Matthew series that we're doing. That's right. So we finish next week on week 126. Good job. You nailed it. I was hoping somebody would shout it out before I got there, but you failed miserably. Matthew chapter 28 is where we are today. Before we read these verses, I want to talk about that seal I mentioned last week again. I might disappoint you. I'll probably let you down, but I told you that that seal was solid, and we'll talk about it in just a second. We're going to look at the first 15 verses of the book of Matthew. This thing's wobbling, driving me crazy. There we go. And uh, we're going to look at the first 15 verses of the 28th chapter of Matthew. That's only going to leave a little bitty section for next week. I know it's so weird. It's not Easter, it's Christmas, and we're looking at the resurrection of Christ. But I feel like it's the way the Lord's designed it so that we would learn more about this book and this author and we'll wrap it up um, next week when we see some uh, commissioning that the Lord does. But I am excited about it. I really am. But this seal that I'm talking about, in case you hadn't been with us, was the seal that once Christ died on the tree, you already remember this, his flesh is ripped off. I'm talking muscle too, as David said a couple of weeks ago and reminded us about. He's buried in a buried tomb from Joseph. And he gets in this tomb deader than a doorknob, Sol rock solid dead. That's important. It's important because without the death, we don't celebrate the resurrection. It's very important to realize that Jesus was absolutely dead, absolutely dead. So this comes in with this seal that I mentioned. Last week, I said that, uh, that pilot said, you've got a guard of soldiers well, some believe, and if I'm doing my homework right, I don't know, it could be way off. That's probably about 16 dudes. It kind of makes sense if you read it that way, because in a little bit it says some of them went. Well, if it was only two, it wouldn't say some of them. You see what I mean? So it, it had to be a, quite a, a little number there. But anyway, the seal that was set in place by this particular uh, governing authority would have been rock solid. This would have been something that was unpenetratable. And if it had been penetrated, then these guys, these soldiers, these elite group would be in big trouble. See, out of the group, they, they would take a, a shift, a different, about a three-hour shift. It was not acceptable for them to fall asleep on the job. If they fell asleep on the job like this, it would be as if today's Secret Service fell asleep while they're protecting the president or the vice president or... Me, whoever they're protecting. I don't know why I said me. That was weird. But what I'm saying is that these guys would have a consequence to pay. And back in the day, it didn't mean like today would they would lose their job. It meant they might lose their life. Not only would they lose their life, but maybe the other guards that were with them. So they held each other accountable. If they got caught um, sleeping on the job, then the other ones might want to beat them up. You see what I mean? Because if they knew they might lose their job because a team member failed you got a pretty big difficulty. So this seal was put in place. It was impossible for this seal to be penetrated. I said last week, this is important. But one thing that this would have included when the governor is willing to say this thing's completely sealed is they would have went in and made sure the body was there first. 
Now, you're going to see a lie in a few minutes when we get over to verse uh, 14 and 15. So that's why I'm going ahead and telling you this. Because this seal would have included, they investigated this elite group of guards. They investigated, made sure the body was there. Come out, seal it, and be on watch. Taking their, you know, their rotations and being awake even in the middle of the night. So, I believe, and you may be different, but I believe that the seal that was intended to make sure that these uh, disciples didn't steal the body, I believe that it is actually one of the number one proofs that Jesus Christ really rose from the grave. It's pretty cool. I can't wait to read a little bit. Now, that's verse 1 where we're starting in chapter 28. Now, after the Sabbath, the Sabbath, of course, being Saturday, not Sunday, Saturday. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes, his clothing white as snow. And, the, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. <laughs> I read <it> again. <clears throat> Be, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Thank you so much. I want to read it again. Do not be afraid. Listen, y'all. Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. This is a big deal. How bad would you have flipped if you're standing there and an angel comes and it looks like lightning? Could you, you know, you just, you're blinded. You can't see. This is impossible. You're obviously terrified. But it's interesting how this protection was for the ones that had the good intentions, the ladies that were there. The soldiers, they didn't have the bright intentions. They were doing their job, of course, but it was kind of, uh, uh, they were muted, so to speak, right? They fainted. They, whatever you want to call it, they're out for the count. It's so interesting. And so he tells these women, I love that, y'all, and I could read it again, but I would be boring y'all to death because we're not excited about it. We are excited about it. Okay, I'm going to read it again. Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. For he is risen, as he said. Here's why I'm kind of driving that home. They had forgotten what Jesus said. This is why I'm driving that home and letting y'all know how good of a gift giver I am. Because I never listen during the year. I never listen. Uh, Crystal will drop a hint or two, and she's not really dropping a hint. She's just talking about a want or a need. You know what I'm saying? And I should write it down. And every now and then I have, but usually I don't. But this year I did. And I'm proud about it. I'm so excited. She already knows what the gift is. That's the only reason I'm talking about it. You may have already figured that out. See, Mary and Mary and Joanna, and there were some others that were with them. You read the other accounts, and you'll discover this. There was multiple ladies there. They had forgotten some of these things that Jesus said would happen. And certainly the 12 did. Judas had already killed himself. There's not 12 anymore. There's 11. And all of a sudden they forgot too because they were nowhere to be found. They were scattered. But if they would have remembered them words, they would have been there waiting on Jesus to pop out. They would have took a front row seat, grabbed their folding chair, whatever, and they would have been waiting. But they forgot the words. See, the best gift we could ever receive is Christ, right? And so he's wrapped up in this tomb. I know this is going to be corny, but he's wrapped up in this tomb. And you would be waiting, wanting to open the gift if you remembered the words that he said. But we've got to give them the benefit of the doubt. 
Because for us today, when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. He's our comforter. I would use the word reminder, right? He reminds us of Scripture. He reminds us of things Christ said. There's all kind of things that our Holy Spirit does, that the Holy Spirit does. But at this moment, they're not yet filled with the Holy Spirit. The emphasis that I was putting there was trying to be so that we would remember that they had actually forgotten some of the things. But here's what the um, angel continues to say, because I interrupted him right in the middle of his sentence. He says, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. The angel's job is done for that particular thing. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up, and they took hold of his feet, and they worshipped. Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. It said that these ladies, they, they came up and they took hold of his feet and they worshiped. What do we do when we see Jesus? You ever driving down the interstate and you see another billboard that says Jesus saves? That's not really seeing Jesus. I, I know that, but that's seeing his name, right? Sometimes we get so exhausted of seeing his name. It's kind of going to get real and kind of maybe uncomfortable. But sometimes we just get so tired. I don't know why, though. Maybe it's our flesh, right? It's our flesh. It's not Christ in us. It's our flesh. And maybe you don't feel that way right now. You are not sick of Christmas music yet. You are not sick of anything about Christmas. You are not tired of hearing about Jesus. But maybe for a season in your life, you, you have been. See, these ladies, Mary and Mary and all these other, they, they weren't tired of hearing about this Jesus. And it was fresh because he had just died, but they weren't tired of it. But I think about these disciples in this particular situation. Were they, ti- were they, were they already just over it? I'm trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. They weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I, I get that, but where are they? They're not, where, where are they? And they're kind of scattered out. And, and, and they're, they're all over the place. And it's, it's weird. But one thing that, that this angel says when you, when you look in Mark or even in Luke, I don't remember which one it is, but you can look for yourself. One thing that he says is when he says, go and tell my disciples, go and tell the disciples, go and tell the 11, go and do this. He says, and Peter. And Peter. Now listen, for us, let's backtrack a couple of months in a, in a sermon where we talked about Peter denying Christ before the rooster crowed. Remember? Well, even though we're taking months to go through this, this happened in a pretty condensed time period. So you get this guy named Peter who had denied Christ. You remember? And Christ is in there. He's on his way to the trial. He's on his way to the cross. And Peter looks in there and they make eye contact right after that rooster crows. You can imagine how Peter felt, right? He felt so ashamed of himself. It was as if he had been out of church for a little while. It... It, it was as if, like, he knew that person at work that he was supposed to be. I mean, it's the end of the year again. And it was your New Year's resolution to talk to that one person about Christ. And, and all of a sudden, and it's just, oh, and it's all over you. And maybe there was some shame. And maybe that's why Peter didn't come around. And, and maybe he wasn't around and he told the others. He's like, man, I can't even, I can't even, I can't even watch any of this crucifixion. I can't, I can't. I, I think about it that way. But he said, and Peter. So the good news is this. Not that we have to beat ourselves up because we hadn't been in church like we wanted to be or we're just now getting back in the routine or that we forgot to witness to the dude. We only had a year, right? But we forgot to witness to the dude or the dudeette that we were supposed to. See, the, the, the beauty in this is not the, all the bad that we did or all the neglect that we showed. The beauty in this is the goodness of God. It's always the, the most powerful component in the Easter Christmas 
everything story. It's the gospel message, isn't it? It's the good news of Jesus Christ, the grace that abounds, the grace that is there. We don't catch ourselves beating ourselves down like Peter, or we do catch ourselves beating ourselves down like Peter, but we can't stay there. See, in this message, it doesn't sound like Peter's in it, but he is when you look at the other accounts. But what jumps out at me is certainly that, but also these ladies that came up and they took Jesus by the feet and they worshiped him. And I'm just like, all right, Adam, what is your response? I know the billboard's a corny illustration, but what is my response when we're coming back from Dalton? And right there at Carpets of Dalton, there's always a billboard that says, Jesus saves. And then they get like in your face. And it's like, and if you don't believe that, you're going to burn. I mean, you know, that's a little, eh. But there's a phone number on there, Call for Truth. I don't know how effective the billboard is, but I'm saying, has there been a season in maybe your life where you're like, oh, it's Jesus again. See, I think our perspective's wrong, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. And, and, and maybe I'll bounce back, but listen, the, se the seal was solid. Look at verse 11 here. It says this, it says, While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. Verse 12. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, that means they huddled up and figured out what to do. That means they huddled up and figured out what to do because this elite guard came and they said, listen, you ain't going to believe this, but dude looked like lightning. There's this thing that came. I don't know if it was an angel. I don't know what it was, but it, it came and it was white as snow and it looked like lightning. You couldn't even stare at it and your eyes were hurting and we were blinking like crazy and the earthquake happened and all of a sudden the body's gone. Jesus is up and he's walking. Jesus is risen and he's the king. Jesus is alive and he's the Lord. Maybe they didn't say all that, but they say, listen, we don't know. We, we feel like uh, we don't know how to explain ourselves. So the elites, so the, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, these, this group, these ones that hated Jesus, they take counsel and figure out what to do. And it says that they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole the body away while we were asleep. This is an absolute and utter lie. This would have been an elite force. It would have been impossible for them to have been asleep on the job because of the rotation. Not only because of the rotation, but they would have been the elite. These soldiers were special. They were trained. They had a guard. This could not have happened. And if it did happen, guess what? We would be talking about the death of all of these soldiers. I still don't know what happened with all of the soldiers. Maybe some of them were injured or whatever. But then think about it. If the government would have then killed them for letting the body get gone, then it would have blew the cover of them just saying, hey, they got them when they was asleep. Oh, wait, but that blew their cover anyway because they're supposed to be an elite force and this is supposed to have a seal. So how in the world did the tomb get penetrated? It sounds like it's a lie, doesn't it? But they give them some money. And they lie for a lousy little dollar. The other thing they lie about is, think about this. I'm no Navy SEAL. I mean, I don't even know if I can swim. I used to swim like three laps, and just back and forth in our above ground pool. I think it's 24 feet. I was struggling right then. I could run forever, but you make me swim, we're done. So I'm no Navy SEAL. I'm no Green Beret. I'm, I'm no elite soldier. But if I were an elite soldier and my wife knew I was an elite soldier, how would I feel when I looked at her and I said, Hey, babe, you know how elite I am. I fell asleep on the job and they stole that body. See, this is such an obvious, utter, ridiculous lie. And a whole lot of people didn't fall for it, but, but a whole lot of people did. Verse 14, we're almost there. And it says, And if this comes up to the governor's ears, we'll satisfy him. And keep you out of trouble. Oh, they would have got in trouble then if the body was gone. But the governor won't know about that little dollar dollar. Verse 15. So they took the money and did as they were, were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now when it says to this day, it means when this was written. When Matthew writ, wrote this, he said people still believe this. But I'm going to tell you that it still stands today. Not, not 
I'm just saying there's a lot of Jews that still believe this. That there's a lot of people that do not believe that Christ is actually our Messiah. Yesterday, I spent about 20 minutes wrapping one present. It took me forever. My mom offered two, and I was like, nope, nope, I got to do it myself. It's think about this tall, about that wide, look like one of them speakers. I'm wrapping it up, and then you realize the wrapping paper ain't big enough. You know, you got to have big old wrapping paper to make that flip all the way over the top or ever how you're supposed to do it. So I get in these awkward positions, and these, they, it, it's weird. It's on the floor, and I can't explain it. I'm using all my mom's tape. You got some more tape. Yep, you got some more tape. I'm cutting things, and I'm like, I don't know if this works or not. But the paper blended together good, so I pulled it off. I was pumped about it, so I take it home. We had some friends there. Mabel had some friends, and I wrapped two more smaller packages. Now, they're still under the tree, but I go inside with this big package, and Crystal's cooking. She's making all kind of treats, some dip and some, some chocolate-covered strawberries, and yes, I'm spoiled. And I go in there, and she says, who's that for? Like she don't know, and it had a thing on it. It said, from Adam to C.C., and she said, oh, oh, and I put it under the tree or to the side of the tree because it's so big. And she's cooking over here and she goes over there and she's like, oh, I know what it is. And she's doing this, you know what I'm talking about? The excited hop. She's excited hopping. And she said, I know what that is. That's my chandelier. And I'm like, how did she know? She knows. Oh, she knows. But all this is happening in my head because by this time she's over there opening it. I'm slapping her hand and pushing her away and telling her she's got to wait till Christmas and she won't. So by this time, Mabry and her friends gather around and she's opening it and rips open the top and says, it's my chandelier. It's my chandelier. And she is pumped. And she attaches to me with a great, beautiful hug that a loved one would give somebody when they got a present that they wanted and they were expecting because they had mentioned it some time ago and she got this present that she wanted because I listened because I'm trying to redeem myself and I listened earlier this year and I got that deer antler chandelier that's made out of fake deer antlers and it's white and it's beautiful and she hugged me about ripped me in half and I thought oh that's a good hug and it was and we smooched we didn't kiss we didn't but she had me so tight, so tight, because I got her something that she wanted, and she probably forgot that I took the hint. Sometimes we've been Christians for so long that we just get used to it. We hear this story, and we hear this story every year at Christmas, and we hear this story every year at Easter. And we just get so used to it. And we do. And it's, it's, it's as if we forgot when we got saved. We know that Jesus is, is, is more than a gift that could be in a box. We know that. We know that, don't we? But it's like we go through the motions of life and somebody gets sick and, and this or that happens. And next thing you know, we, we feel like we're not living up to what we ought to be living up to as Christians. We, we might feel like we're not listening to the hints during the year. But they're there and they're present and they matter. And see, we, we can go through life and we can continue to just be used to Jesus. Oh, yeah, Jesus saves. Oh, yeah, that billboard's right. Jesus saves. Or we can decide that 2021 is going to look a little different. And, and, and we're going to do something different when we're reminded of that. Right? And, and maybe we just get bogged down at Christmas time like Matt prayed about. And maybe we just get bogged down during work. And, and maybe we just get so bogged down. But I wonder sometimes when we're that bogged down, what's really going on as Jesus is, is observing us right now. Because listen, church, we ought to be a beautiful present to a lost and dying world. This, this present ought to look so beautiful that outsiders would look in and they would say, I got to be a part of that. Not that I want to be, but I have to be because there's life there. 
There's excitement there. There's joy there. There's grace and there's mercy. These people forgive each other. These people buy stuff for each other when it doesn't make sense. These people give gift to each other. We need to be that. But sometimes we, we are too bogged down with coronavirus or something else. You know what I'm saying? And we finally get back in the routine. But I thought about it as we were worshiping this morning. I ain't trying to beat nobody down. I'm trying to lift us up and encourage us. But I thought about it this morning. And I thought, man, why ain't this place just packed out every week? If this Jesus, if this Jesus is really who he said he was, and I believe that he is, then why ain't I more excited about that? And y'all know my excitement level. Right? How's that not more contagious to the people around me? And I can't explain those mysteries because it's God's business who he, pricks, who, who he pricks and draws to himself, isn't it? But I do know that my job is to spread his fame. So how can we do that? We can do that with putting some basketball goals together because there's going to be 10 kids that didn't have a basketball goal. And they don't care that this thing was donated and that it looked a little scrappy and that we had to use bolts that didn't come with it when it was factory built. Because these kids are going to have something in front of them that means something. See, when we have a gift in front of us that means something, maybe it's because we dropped a hint or maybe it's just because we remember the words of Christ. When it means something, it's more precious to us. Peter had a gift in front of him. His name is Jesus. And oh, how precious, precious Jesus was to Peter. But did you catch earlier what I said? The angel made sure. By the way, the angel was directed by Jesus. The angel made sure to say, hey, don't forget to tell Peter. Because listen, as much as Jesus is a precious gift to Peter, I can assure you that Peter is a more precious gift to Jesus. Have you viewed yourself the right way? Are you viewing yourself the way that Jesus Christ views you, child of God? You are a child of God. When Jesus told Mary and Mary and Joanna and the others to go tell the eleven, he said, go tell my brothers. We are heirs with Christ. Now, if that don't put a little air under you, if that don't put a little air under your wings, nothing will. See, we get to inherit the kingdom of God because of the works of Christ. Because he's the greatest prize. He's the greatest joy. He's the greatest hope. Not us. And that is the joy and the hope that we need to live from this Christmas season. Not that we get prepared to regret what we swiped on a credit card. Not that we beat ourselves down with all them kind of things, but that we focus on Christ. Man, I, I just feel with all of my heart that the church is supposed to be a gift to the world because we are literally the representatives of Jesus Christ right now. And sometimes we forget that. And we need an angel to come remind us. And sometimes that angel's your wife. But sometimes it's literally an angel. We need that reminder, and y'all know where it comes from. I'm going to hit you with this just because you've never heard me say it. It's almost January 1st. If you read 3.257 chapters a day, you will finish all 1,189 chapters in a year. Let's read this book next year. The whole thing, cover to cover. Oh, oh, oh man. Adam, I, man, I've, I've done a lot of cool things, Adam. I am a former Navy SEAL, but I can't read that book. Oh. They drowned me in training, but I lived. 
but I can't read a whole book, man. It's impossible to understand. That's one of the biggest lies of the enemy is that you can't understand it and you need me to tell you. That ain't my job. The Holy Spirit's job. Let's be a gift to Floyd County. And the way that we become a gift to Floyd County is we know what the gift, capital G, talking about Jesus, tells us to do. Let's be a gift. Let's be a gift. And if something resonated with you when I was talking today and you're like, oh man, I really don't know Jesus, then I want to invite you to make it right. If something resonated with you today and you were thinking, I need a Redeemer with a capital R, not a gift-giving Redeemer, but a Jesus Redeemer. I need Him to make my wrongs right. Then you trust all the righteous things that He did. So if you're lost and you don't know Jesus, if you're in this room, if you're on this camera, uh, well, you wouldn't be on the camera, I am, but if you're at home, wh whatever I'm trying to say, then here's what I believe Jesus wants of you today. He wants you to know that you are valuable to Him. That's important. We have worth in God's eyes. We mean something to Him or Jesus wouldn't have died for us. This is important. This is a big deal. And that if we will trust Him, then He gives us His righteousness. It's crazy. We don't deserve it. That's why it's called grace. And so I can't lead you in a prayer because there's not a magical formula. But I can tell you this. If you just say, Jesus, I want to follow you. And you mean it. Then there's something magical there. And you just talk to him. You might talk to him about some sin and tell him you're sorry and repent of it, which means turn from it, quit doing it. Quit making up excuses and turn from it and quit doing it. And say, I see you, Jesus, and I want you. And just tell him you want to follow him. Because once upon a time, there was a knucklehead named Levi, and he quickly became Matthew. But Jesus walked by him. He was at his tax booth. We've been talking about him for two and a half years. But he was at his tax booth. And when Jesus came by, Jesus didn't say, say this prayer after me. Jesus didn't say, repeat this prayer after me. Jesus said, follow me. And Matthew got up and abandoned everything. And he followed Jesus Christ. So listen, Matthew didn't know that he was following Jesus because he repeated a prayer after somebody. He knew he was following Jesus because he was following Jesus. So if you're claiming to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then I need you to make sure that you are following Jesus. And the way we do that is hopefully what we're doing right now. And we know what he says in his word. And we try to be doers of of that word. I've been real burdened with what can we do during this season? What can we look like? What, can, what, what do we do? And there's been a few opportunities that have arisen, and I've already shared one with you about the goals. But I feel like there might be a few last-minute things that come up. So if you're willing, in, in, in a small capacity... To just let me know that you're willing if something comes up. At churches, you hear about things last minute as we get closer to Christmas. But you can email me, adam at we church and just put, I'm willing. And then I'll have your email, and I can get back in touch with you. But if something comes up, if there's a need that arises, or something like that, a family in need, then I'll let you know. And you can serve them. Because maybe you're beating yourself up right now, because you're like, man, I should have put basketball goals together yesterday. Some of you's not. You had legit things to do. I totally understand that. But see, church, if we're going to be a blessing to people, then we need to be a blessing to people. If you're not being a blessing to people, then you're not a blessing to people. Let's bless people. Let's bless people. And I want us to do something a little different. They might play a little... A little something, but I want us to pray. 
Because, y'all, there's this little boy, and I do not have permission to say this, but I, I feel like no parent in this position would mind. So I don't know this family, so I didn't go and get permission. But one of our staff members knows of a little boy, three years old, named Tyson, and you've probably heard of him in the model area. And they've called hospice on his three years. And y'all, it crushes me. It crushes me. And because of your generous giving, we have some plans to help this family if he doesn't make it. But I'm praying for his healing. Shouldn't we do that? Shouldn't we bless people? And the biggest blessing we can give is to ask for healing and to pray for somebody. But this little boy's been battling this for a couple of years, and Katie showed me a picture this morning, and it broke my heart even more, y'all, because I saw a picture of this little dude, and he does not look like himself. But if the Lord does choose to take him home, he will look more like himself than he ever has. But I feel the burden to continue asking the Lord to heal him. He might not, but he might. So I'm going to ask the guys that if y'all want to sing, sing. If you just want to play, play. But y'all make your way up because I'm going to ask you to do something. I just want to pray for that kid. So if you're willing, would you just kind of just, I know some of us don't want to be close to each other. I get that. Like just bow at your seat or come up here and be shoulder to shoulder with me because I got the antibodies, baby. I really do. <laughs> Great feeling. But let's pray for him. And let's pray for his family. Because it just breaks me, y'all. Three years old. So if you're willing, just bow, turn around at your chair, come up here, whatever you want to do. And they're going to play. And I'll just give everybody some time as they play. And after that, I'll turn my, mat back, my m microphone back on, and then we'll kind of pray corporately. But as they play, please be reminded of the goodness of God and ask him to heal this kid. Please. And if you've got some sin that you need to repent of, now's a great opportunity. And if you want to make some kind of new commitment to the Lord, then now's a great opportunity. And if you just want to say, Jesus, I'm sorry for, for forgetting or suppressing or just overlooking sometimes that you are the greatest gift, just talk to him. Just talk to him.
So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your praise in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, holy, it's your praise in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out your bread our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only let's pray y'all Father we just are so thankful that you have sent Jesus we are so thankful Jesus that you were perfect and that you lived a perfect life we're so thankful for that. We thank you for spilling your blood for us. We thank you for willingly climbing on the tree. We thank you for the words you said, it is finished. I thank you for paying the price that I would never be able to pay. I worship you. I adore you, Father. We want you to accept our cries right now. Father, I ask that you accept our pleas and I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you heal this young boy I'm asking in Jesus name that you heal this little boy named Tyson completely and I understand God that there's not a lot of hope and I understand that they're vulnerable right now God and I understand that there's a that they're hurting and, and I'm not trying to fabricate a false hope or anything like that. But I know that there's still hope in you, God. And I believe that you are the God of the universe. I believe that you heal people. I believe that you are capable. I believe that you are a strong tower. I believe that you are ultimate. I believe that you are the great physician, God. And as we lift our voices on behalf of this family, I pray that you hear me. I pray that you hear me and heal him, God. I'm asking you to do this. I wouldn't dare try to boss you around. I am asking you to do this because I trust you. I understand that you have a will. I understand that you have a way. I know that you are sovereign and I'm not. I'm your clay right now, God. I am your clay and I understand that I don't know tomorrow and you do. But as a father myself, God, I pray that you heal this kid in Jesus' name. Please, please, <laughs> please heal this kid, God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus Christ's name, I ask you to do it. I know you can. Please give him an appetite. Please, God, please do it. And I ask you to do this because I trust you and I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. as we leave today, I pray that, um, that we would continue to be in prayer for this family. You know, it's, I find myself, I can only speak for myself, but I find myself 
realizing how little faith I have sometimes because when I hear things like that, I think of all the reasons why it can't happen. You don't see it happen much. Like we're already past this point, and especially with me, you know, being a nurse, I see it all the time. Like I'm that person so many times that say, well, this, this is the time where we start thinking this, and I forget that you're God. I'm not saying you will do anything. I'm just saying you absolutely can Our view of you is so weak, Father, or mine is. And I don't see you do a whole lot because the truth is a lot of times I just don't ask for it. And I don't believe that I control your hand or that Adam controls your hand or anyone in this church can whip you into shape and make you do what we want. But we should pray as if we believe anything is possible. And when we pray and we pray and we don't see it happen, we don't walk away like spoiled children and never do it again. We come back the next time. And we pray as if anything is possible. Not because we're trying to make it happen, but because we believe that you're God. And we believe your word says that the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Not that I feel like I'm righteous, Father but we have the righteousness of Christ in us. I pray that as we leave this place today, God, that your name would be on our lips, that you would forgive us for the way we are to those around us who may or may not know you, that you would forgive us to not have, for not having the joy in us that ought to be seen in us. And I pray that the breath that you've put in us, Father, would be used to come back out for you. I thank you for our brothers and sisters in this room this morning that, that come week after week, that join with us just to worship you. I pray blessings over their life, God. I pray that you would just pour yourself out on their families, on their workplaces, on the places that they go, restaurants they go into, places they go every day. I pray, I pray that you would use them to bring hope and, and joy to others, God. Father, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys have a great week.